Hello everyone, this is Adam here with another Here to Listen uh, mini podcast, part of our community awareness podcast. Uh, happy to welcome in Sarah here from the Terence Higgins Trust. Hi Sarah. Hi. Hi. Thanks um, for having me. <laughs> yeah, and um, you're a familiar face actually. I've been at the events before and the sort of uh, the, the wave of young people that come in and uh, I think you did testing and things like that and band yeah. and all, all sorts band of stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and for our new cohort, um, it's a bit up in the air about what the final say is on what what form the NCS is going to take, but um, the hope is that we'll still continue in some, some capacity, if, even if it's just a digital program. Um, with that, we thought we'd put together these videos, which is, you know, a little different to what you've experienced before, but hopefully we can, we can get the same benefit, which is to find out about your organisation as a whole, uh, about your role and, you know, how social action kind of fits in there as well. So maybe you can start by just saying a little bit about the Terence Higgins Trust. And I'm actually a little bit curious about how it started. So if you want to kind of add that ah, in. You know, okay. Yeah. So the Terence Higgins Trust is a national HIV and sexual health charity. Um, so the sexual health bit is a fairly new addition. Um, Terence Higgins was the first guy in the UK to die of AIDS-related diseases or illnesses. Um, he died in 1983. And in 1983, HIV was still a massive death sentence. Um, if you got it, you would, you would die. You are going to die. And you would probably die in a not very nice situation either. So nurses in hospitals didn't want to touch HIV patients. Um, they were put into segregation. It was still believed to be a gay man disease, you know, that other people didn't get it. There was still a lot of like misinformation and a lot of fear around HIV at that time. Um, when Terence Higgins died, his friends and family wanted to do something to reduce stigma. They wanted other people to have a better chance than, than Terence had. So they started the Terence Higgins Trust um, in his name to campaign, to research, and you know that's what they've done ever since. And um, we've been at the forefront of HIV um, work in the UK basically since the 80s. Um, and now we diversify into like all of sexual health. So in Bedfordshire, we work in partnership with an organisation called ICASH, uh, which stands for Integrated Contraceptive and Sexual Health. Um, we deliver all of the sexual health services for the whole of the county. So ICASH have the clinics where they have trained nurses and doctors that people can walk, well, could walk into. Now you make an appointment, but they're still running, they're still providing sexual health services. Um, and Terence Higgins Trust, we provide still the HIV side of support, um, but also the young people's work. Mm -hmm. So that's what I do. Um, when I say young people's work, we do all forms of kind of testing. So when we go out in the community, we do chlamydia and gonorrhea testing in the community outreach. So basically people don't have to come into clinic, they can just see us where we are, do that testing. Um, we also do education work with young people. Um, basically we'll go anywhere where under 25s are and we'll try and raise the profile of sexual health, um, make it normal, offer testing, offer C cards. C card is a condom distribution card. So if young people get one, they can access condoms wherever they see the C card sign, mm -hmm. which is great because they don't have to walk into a pharmacy and ask for condoms. They can just show the card and get the condom, mm -hmm. uh, which is fab. And those pharmacies work with us. They're all trained that there's procedures obviously in place that make sure that everyone's safeguarded and everyone's safe and they're able to access the condoms. So, yeah, everything to do with sex and relationships with them. <laughs> uh, and how long have you worked for the Terence Higgins? So I worked for the Terence Higgins the last three years. Uh -huh. uh, before that, I was with Brooke. Okay. Mm -hmm. Brooke Young People Sexual Health Service, and I was with them for like ten years. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> There's a reason I asked that because um, you know if we add it up, it's about thirteen years in 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 that field, and I wondered about what trends and what sort of modifications you've seen over that thirteen year period compared to you know from thirteen years ago to like now. What do you think's changed? I think. Changed? I think the world of sex and relationships is, has always been a tricky place for young people mm -hmm. because, you know, it's still a bit taboo. We still don't really talk about sex and relationships. You know, we, 
you know, I always use this metaphor when I talk about young people and sex and relationships, is that we don't expect a 17-year-old to jump into a car with no lessons on how to drive it and be safe on the road. But yet what we do do is we expect young people to enter into sexualized relationships without any real knowledge of where the boundaries lie and how to navigate all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So I would say from 13 years ago till today, I'm still seeing people with misinformation, with a, a, a skewed idea of what a, a sexual relationship maybe should be, um, because they've not really had that information. And if no one tells you, you don't know, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. Um, from when I first started till now, we see a lot more sexting, a lot more online stuff, people getting into trouble with that. Um, you know, lots of people don't know that actually you have to be 18 to look at pornographic material. That, inv that includes a, a naked selfie, even of yourself. You have to be 18 to be in a pornographic image, mm -hmm. even if you're taking it of yourself. And I think it's tricky for young people because they can fall over that bit of legislation quite easily and find themselves on the wrong side of the law just by taking a naked selfie and just sending it to my boyfriend, mm -hmm. um, which seems quite innocent. But what you know, the ramifications of these images is is massive, um, and you know. What we try and say is, look, think about it. Mm. If you put an image out there that you wouldn't want your nan to see, then, you know, maybe don't send it. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of key, I think. <laughs> you know? mm. Because, you know, these laws exist and they don't seem to have any relevance. You know, you can be 16 and have sex, but actually you can't take a naked selfie, even of yourself, until you are over 18. Mm -hmm. and, and you know that's that's a that's a big problem sometimes yeah and it sounds it sounds like a, a sort of a cultural thing um that I, I guess we're all guilty of you know we spot a thing and we just want to tell people about it by posting about it and i think yeah. so much of that is almost instinctual and when you when you said earlier about have a think first mm. I, I, I think that's quite a tricky thing it's not a tricky thing to ask, but it's a tricky thing to actually put into practice. Well, like, yeah. You know, the hesitancy before, because mostly it's just like, duh, 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 add a photo, get a link, get a, get a meme together, bosh, send it out, end of, without much thought at all, it seems, because we're kind of... We live in such an instant society now, don't we? You know, yeah. everything's instant, everything's at our fingertips. Um, and it does kind of not give us that break for thought sometimes. And I think especially if you're a young person, I think things... You know, I wouldn't want to be a teenager now. <laughs> Things are so much more pressured, so much more instant. Um, and there isn't the, the allowance for that. I think a lot of young people feel a lot of pressure, mm -hmm. a lot of pressure to send images and, and look at images and do all that. So, mm -hmm. yeah, and, it, you know, when we go out and we teach about these things, we certainly, you know, we don't do we don't say don't do it, it's really bad. We say, think about it, think of the ramifications, know you know the law, make informed decisions. Mm. You know, and that's that's really the key, I think, is, is knowing the information, knowing having enough of information to hand about sex, relationships, imaging, whatever it is, that when you make the decision, it's an informed decision that's right for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Going back to the wider organisation as well around um, sexual health as well, have, have you noticed any uh, changes in treatment? Because you talked about um, the early days of the Terence Higgins Trust and how, you know, if you had HIV or AIDS, that, that was it. And um, I've, I've listened to podcasts occasionally that almost jokingly say that it's just something you recover from now. And I'd like to know your thoughts on the gap between that. You know, is it, you know, you're, you're sorted or is it like you're doomed? Or where is it in the scale, do you feel? Yeah, I mean, HIV is still a life-changing illness. Mm -hmm. You know, people, I mean, people with HIV living in the UK can live a, a life expectancy the same as you are right now. Okay, so we've got an ageing population in the UK of people living with HIV, mm -hmm. um, which obviously comes with its own problems because of the ageing process anyway. But what it does mean is that those people do have to take medication every day and it's, some of it's quite a lot of medication. Mm. Um, so the prognosis is much, much better. We have people living 
80, 90 years. But what it does mean is that they still have to maintain their health. They have to take medication every day. They'll still have to like regularly see doctors and things. Um, so I would, I would never want to give the message of, oh, it's fine, you know, it's fine if you get HIV, because, mm. you know, let's avoid all STIs if we can, because we can, because we have condoms and we have things in place to make sure that we don't um, get STIs. But having said that, yes, people do live in the UK a normal life expectancy, and um, we won't get too far into, like, the mechanics of HIV, because it can be, <laughs> it's quite... Um, complex mm -hmm. but people live in the UK with HIV with what we call a, a zero viral load so that they're undetectable mm -hmm. once somebody is on effective medication in the UK and their viral load is zero they're undetectable they have a zero percent chance of passing the infection on even through unprotected sex mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so if someone's got the HIV and they're on effective medication they have a zero percent chance of passing it on even if they have unprotected sex, which is a massive step forward um, from where we were in the 80s, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, we also say, have, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, we also have drugs, PrEP and PEP. So we have pro uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis. So people who are, um, they know that maybe their lifestyle is a bit more risky or they know that they are at risk of contracting HIV. They can take a tablet every day that will literally stop the transmission. Mm -hmm. um, that has been on trial um, currently in the UK. So just a few people have been taking it as a trial. Um, the last information I've got is they are looking to roll that out to everybody, um, which is fabulous, really great. Mm -hmm. um, we also have post-exposure prophylaxis, and that's been around for quite a while now. So if somebody knows that they have been exposed or you know they, they get a needle stick injury or something like that, they can have the post-exposure prophylaxis that will stop the transmission of the HIV as well. Mm -hmm. so we've got lots of things now that um, you know affect HIV and its treatment and, it, and all that stuff. So we, you know, we have made massive, massive inroads into it in the UK, which is absolutely brilliant. And, mm -hmm. you know, really good. The, the services that you talked about earlier seem quite focused on the prevention and the advice and, and that sort of stuff. I wondered what kind of services that are available to people that perhaps find out that they've got uh, an S STD or even more extreme, like you were saying, you know, and, and as a service, is, is that something you cover as well in terms of supporting people that have had a recent diagnosis, things like that? Yeah, yeah. So if I talk a bit about chlamydia, because I suppose that's really where um, my job role is, is young people and chlamydia. Um, um, the reason we focus on chlamydia um, is because it is the most common in under 25 year olds. So um, the current figures we, we talk about is about one in 10 sexually active young people um, across Bedfordshire have chlamydia. Um, so it's really common, it's a really common thing. Um, chlamydia is a bacterial infection, so you get it through unprotected sex and the transmission of sexual bodily fluids. Okay, we're going to talk about sexual bodily fluids. I mean, lovely things like anal mucus, vaginal secretion, and semen. Okay, so lots of young people say to me, oh, I can't possibly have chlamydia, I've never had sex. Well, anything you've done with anyone where those bodily fluids have been in play, it, there's a risk there. If they've got the bacteria in their bodily fluids and you've been in contact with their bodily fluids, there's a risk there that you've um, got that bacteria as well. Oh. So you've got will get chlamydia so it's like super easy to catch if you're having unprotected sex then there's always going to be a risk of contracting bacteria for chlamydia mm -hmm. um, having said that it is really super easy to catch it's also really easy to test for um, and that's what we do is we go around and we offer these just a pee pot test so guys just do a pee in a pot girls can either do a low vaginal swab it's a self swab they do for themselves or they can pee in a pot as well um, and as you say, it's really important then that once we've taken those tests in, we don't just go, oh yeah, that's, that's, done, that's us done, off you go, you, you deal with the after effects. So what we have is we have like a wraparound service really. So we offer the testing, so a young person would come to us, do testing, we'd send those tests away. We, we work with a big lab in London called the Doctors Laboratory. They do thousands and thousands of tests 
per day, where they're just looking for those bacteria for chlamydia and gonorrhea. Um, and if there is a, a, a positive test, so somebody who's come to us has got that bacteria in their urine, we would then get that result. And we have a, a worker results officer in our office called Emma, who's absolutely lovely. She would ring that young person personally and speak to them about the fact that they've got this bacteria, but actually it's really easy to get rid of as well. So she would let them, she would find out where they live and she would say, okay, we've got a pharmacy near to you that does the treatment. Or she would say, well, the clinic is quite near to you. Why don't you come in to get your treatment? And then she would arrange that visit. So if it was, say, a pharmacy, she would ring up the pharmacy to tell them that young person was coming in. So the young person wouldn't be walking in like completely cold, having to say, oh, you know, I've got chlamydia, I need treatment that pharmacist would be expecting that young person. They would walk in and say, oh, Emma from THG sent me. Pharmacists would know what they were there for and give them the treatment. And the treatment is just a course of antibiotics. Mm -hmm. It's the seven day of antibiotics. No sex for seven days. That's a killer for some young people. Right? But it's really important that they comply to the no sex for seven days. And if they do, if they take their antibiotics and they comply with no sex for seven days, that bacteria will be completely gone mm -hmm. and then of course that infection completely. Mm -hmm. So it's a really, really simple um, process, but it's also a really common one. So, you know, what we do is we really try and work to, you know, just raise awareness, make this normal. We just want to normalise the conversation around sexual health. You know, sexual relationships, generally speaking, is part of pretty much everybody's life. And what we did just need to do is go, okay, well, let's just have open, honest conversation. Um, and if we can't or we haven't or something's happened and we've not practiced in safe sex, then let's take responsibility, get the test, get the treatment if needed, and, and it's all fine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know where we're coming from with it. Yeah, it, is, it sounds like a nice advocacy element to it to me, like the you know, the test itself and then... I. I I, I imagine it was difficult to picture the kind of words that your colleague would use when telling a young person that they have it, but I imagine she's got that down, you know, but yes. I, there was a sense for me of like, I wouldn't really know where to start. It's even your tone of voice can affect the outcome in a way like, Oh God, you know, I'm afraid or, you know, certain mm -hmm. words in a sentence um, uh, and being able to sort of say that and then obviously support them and take all the sting out of maybe some embarrassment that might be attached to that as well would you say that goes across the board for for um because you mentioned chlamydia but are, is it for all stds that you would do that for or yeah so we're commissioned as a service to provide chlamydia and gonorrhea screening for young people if young people come into clinic and they want a full screen so all the sexual health um screening that you can have done that they can do that as well and yet yeah, all our trained professionals in clinic would be exactly the same you know they're young people friendly they've had training they know these things and don't forget that you know when an individual comes into a sexual health service they will be probably fairly embarrassed they will probably be thinking oh gosh you know I'm talking about, talk about really intimate details of my life mm. where you know if you sort of switch it around and look from the professional's point of view that's their job they do it every day mm. and while they are sympathetic to individuals and no, we know that you know it's embarrassing you have to talk about your sex life and things but in the same time it's not embarrassing for us Mm. Because we've been there and we've done it and we see it every day. Yeah, it's like your day job. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, it sort of comes with experience for us and it comes with actually, you know, everyone who works for iCash and THT actually really care about young people's sexual health. You know, we really do care that people have the information that they need, they're able to access the help that they need, and they and they and they get the service in a compassionate and kind of understanding way um and yeah i also imagine a part of that is the what the awareness of the, the misinformation out there and i i would i i guess i feel a certain degree of uh, compassion for young people because of that because they're like oh my god they're exposed to this this and that and somehow that becomes normal or normalized and it's like no 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 that's 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 not it at all and th this mm. feeling of wanting to shield them or advise them in the right direction to protect them from that kind of thing which could probably 
be linked to exploitation as well so i can see why as a group you'd be quite passionate about like we need to help people we need to combat you know the misinformation that's out it. there which that's is it. it exactly yeah and you know i sort of always bang on about informed decision making you know you need to have and it goes for everything doesn't it but i think it's especially poignant when it comes to sexual health and relationships you need to have the information available to you so that you can make a good informed decision for yourself based on you know what you really want and if what you really want is to have unprotected sex okay well then let's let's deal with the after bit of that as well you know let's give you all the information so that you can protect yourself and then let's give you all the information so you can protect yourself after that as well <laughs> you know so we do try and provide a really holistic service um to, to for young people and you know we help them try and like help them every step of the way and even through these times you know when people are in lockdown when people aren't working and stuff we are still working we are still available clinics are still open um, our phone lines are still open we've got an absolutely brilliant website called young and free um, so this is www.youngandfree.org.uk um, on the young and free website you can order postal kits so I'm fully aware that some young people kind of walk at oh, having a postal kit sent to my house, but actually they come in a really, really discreet box. You wouldn't know what it was. Um, but if they do want a postal kit, they can order that. They can do the, the sample at home and then just pop it in the free post envelope that, that goes off and then the results get to them the same way. So it would still be Emma if it was a positive result. She would still do that whole bringing around, getting them the treatment, showing them where to go, letting the person know they're coming, all of that stuff. Um, so that's on the Young and Free website. There's also some like little information videos on the Young and Free website that people can watch to just give them a bit more information about different things, condom use, chlamydia, gonorrhea, all those kind of things. Mm -hmm. um, and there's also a really helpful little map that will show them all the C-card distribution points across the county as well so they can order a c card from that website and then they can use it. They, what's a c card so the c card is the condom distribution card mm -hmm. so it's just like a little credit card size bit of cardboard um, it's a two-tier system so if you're under 16 you get one kind of card if you're over 16 you get different the under 16 year old card has six dots on the back you can access condoms at six different places or six times at the same place and they will mark your six dots on the back once you've had your six lots of condoms you have to kind of re-register when you register if you're under 16 there are just a little few questions for you to answer just so that we can make sure that that person is safe and that they're not being forced into anything or that you know they know how to use condoms and all that kind of stuff if you're over 16 you haven't got the six dots, you can just access as many times or as many places as you want, anywhere you see the C card logo. Um, and if you go on the Young Free website, it will show you all the places that you can go. So we've got quite a lot of pharmacies around the area that, that are part of the scheme. Mm -hmm. And as I say, all those pharmacies are trained as well. So that, you know, the idea is if you're accessing condoms, you're obviously looking after your sexual health, which is great. If you do run into any problems, you know that the person in that pharmacy you're going to get the condoms of is a trained professional and you can talk to them as well, or you can ring up us. And Young and Free website is a really good way mm -hmm. to access those kind of services as well. Great. Right. Um, before we get on to talking about uh, social action projects, I was just wondering about the aside from the NCS, obviously young people, you know, that that, that feature in our programmes generally that might come across mm -hmm. this video. Um, Great that there's a phone number, excellent. And obviously we're in lockdown at the moment, but in normal circumstances, where would young people come to? Where are you based? Are you based in Bedford? So yeah, so our clinic is our main clinic is in Bedford. Mm -hmm. So if you know Bedford at all, you'll know where Bedford College is. Mm -hmm. We are opposite Bedford College and just round the corner. So where the Bedford Free School is, we're just round the corner from Bedford Free School next to the Pekin Palace Chinese restaurant. Okay. Uh, and that's our main clinic and on a normal we we'll have drop-in sessions where people can just walk in off the street and be seen mm -hmm. by a clinician and um, we do have another um, clinic in Dunstable as well that's okay. in the Priory Gardens Medical Centre um, so 
that also has drop-in sessions where people can come in um, and just be seen in, in normal circumstances, not in the um, times we're all on COVID-19 lockdown. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I'm aware of uh, commissioning and sort of regions. Is there any restrictions around what uh, where you're located from a living point of view and what service you can access? Or so Terencing and Trust Bedford um, are commissioned for the whole of Bedfordshire. Okay. So if you've got if you live you know you live in Bedfordshire, whether it's Leighton and Buzzard, Sandy, Biggleswade, any any of those areas, mm -hmm. you can access our services. Right. We do have a Terencing and Trust in Milton Keynes as well. So if you're over that way, you can access Terence Higgins Trust in Milton Keynes. Um, we do have a Luton Terence Higgins Trust as well. Um, and there are, um, so there's an NHS sexual health service in Luton that are, you know, amazing service and young people friendly also. Um, it's literally about going, right, Google, where's the nearest sexual health service to me? Um, and, but so Terence Higgins Trust is, is quite national. So we have, we have a lot of offices around the country. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, so getting on to social action projects, have you got any ideas about how our young people can get involved? And I'd like to ask you that from a lockdown point of view and not, you know, is there things that can be done beyond um, our lockdown period as well in terms of social action? Yeah. So um, social action projects. So we're really keen to have young people as part of our decision making processes. So what I would say is if you're particularly passionate about sexual health, if you have a particular passion in an aspect of sexual health, whether that be LGBTQ, whether that be women's rights, whether that be healthy relationships, CSE, anything that kind of speaks to you that makes you go, do you know what, actually I really think that there's a hole here where people aren't getting the information that they need Get in contact with us. Get in contact with us through the Young and Free website. Get in contact through it through Karen Higgins Trust website, through our social media pages, and let us know what you're thinking because we can either help you to do a project for yourself, just with our support, or maybe you can help us to do a project. Mm -hmm. um, we are really keen to reach out to as many young people in as many different areas, you know of of our county that we can mm -hmm. and we are aware that you know we're old <laughs> we don't necessarily know uh, what's going on for young people you know at that time um so if we're not reaching a, a group or if we're not covering an area of of sexual relationships that, you, that a young person who's listening to this thinks yeah i think they could do some more there please contact us and we will we'll work with you to, to fill that gap, really. I imagine a project, something like, um, say, you've got a group of 15 young people, usually 16 actually this year in an NCS team, um, being able to interview other young people, because you, you alluded to sort of uh, a generational gap sometimes between perhaps professionals yeah. and young people, and how on earth are you supposed to really get a temperature of what life is like for a young person? And I can't help feeling there's a lot of opportunity there, be it interviews or surveys or, or video Definitely. conferencing, you know, or yeah. debates or anything like that. Like that that can be put out that would help you as an organization um get a bit more connected perhaps i'm sure you are but you know real current stuff might yeah be. we're interested in any of that any of that stuff and we will always like do our best to support what they want to do or you know if they want us to do it we'll mm -hmm. do it the way they want us to do you see what i mean so we're really really keen on, on young people leading our work because we work for young people so it's really important that they that they guide and they shape what we're doing yeah and um, we, yeah. we don't necessarily in Bedfordshire do uh, traditional fundraising as such mm -hmm. um, because we are a commission service parent tiggins trust nationally do have a fundraising arm so they are always looking for fundraising ideas or fundraising events all of that kind of stuff so if that's the kind of thing that young people want to get involved in then that's absolutely fine and what we would probably do is just pass them on to parents just national team and they would work with them like that so yeah. there are plenty of opportunities really to get involved if this is something that you really feel yeah you know important 
I think is really important. <laughs> you know. Yeah, and like there, there is a preference with the NCS um, to move away from fundraising anyway, not to deprive okay. charities, but because we want young people to really get involved. Think with in a different that, way. Yeah, yeah and, and play a part. There's much more of a part. There's something about raising money and giving it to a charity. There's a disconnect there that I know mm. the NCS was really keen on, on, on not focusing too much on. All right, you can raise money for a thing or buy a thing or provide some service of some sort. Great, that's fine. But straight up um, fundraising isn't really something that we, we focus on these days. Um, but yeah, the other projects sound great and they sound quite nice and current and hands on and young yeah. people, both, you know, which is what we, we would look for in a social action project. And I think we're always keen to access different groups of young people. Maybe, you know, we go into, well, before mm. lockdown, we go into schools and we go into colleges and we go into youth hostels and we go into pubs and clubs and nightclubs. You know, our remit is up to 24. So we'll work with 15 to 24 year olds um, and we're keen to go wherever they are really. But we're, you know, we're limited by our knowledge. Hmm. Young people have much more knowledge than we do about where young people are, where's the best place to engage, where do they want this information, hmm. you know. So any of that stuff is really, really useful. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Great. Uh, well, I think that's a really good uh, overview of the organisation, the work that you do. Sounds great. Uh, it sounds nice that you've ad adapted quite well to the, the lockdown as well. The service is still available, you know, phone lines, that, yeah. you know, that's yeah. great. Um, and uh, I sense a little bit of change around that approaching anyway from what the government have been saying. Um, but I don't want to make this a, a virus focus <laughs> yeah. because we talk enough about it. Um, but yeah, I, I want to thank you very much for your time. That's been great. Um, no worries. If young people want to get in contact around social action, would they come directly to you? You, you know, your email, your office number? Yeah. Yes. So my email is Sarah, which is S A R A H dot Davis, D A V I S, mm -hmm. at THT dot org dot UK. Mm -hmm. By all means, email me in. Yeah. Um, otherwise, you can call um, 0300 300 30 30. Mm -hmm. 0300 300 30 30. That will get you into the clinic. And then you can either leave a message for Parents Against Trust staff. You can ask for me, Sarah, or you can ask for Hugh. Um, and those receptionists who answer that call, they'll put you through to us if they can, or they'll take a message and we'll get it back. So, yeah. So either via the Terence Egan Trust website, either by that email, which is sarah.davis at tht.org.uk, or the 0300 30 30, um, no, 0300 300 30 30 yeah. number, and you'll be directed through to us. Be and sure to it's quite a great name, in, in the just say Terence Egan. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, we'll put it in the, the comments underneath the video. Um, Lovely. But yeah, okay. I should just mention as well, I just think I forgot, when I was talking about chlamydia, um, one of the reasons chlamydia is probably so prominent in young people is that actually it's what we call a silent STI. So a lot of young people don't have any signs or symptoms for it. So I think it's something like 80% of females and 50% of males, they're not going to know they've got chlamydia bacteria because there's no signs or symptoms mm -hmm. that's why we really do encourage people to regularly test mm -hmm. that's why we're kind of always out there pushing and saying come on you know if you've had unprotected sex it's really important that you do get a test mm -hmm. um, and i just think i forgot that when i said about chlamydia so it's really important that just to get that bit in there as well and just say you know it's if you if you're making the kind of decision to be sexually active then it's really important that you make the to look after your sexual health as well great yeah and, and it highlights that the, the ncs participants are not just here to do social action they're, they're here to be aware of services that may be useful to them as well so sure. that, that, that's good okay uh well i'll sign off now thank you very much sarah uh hopefully you in person in a future event and uh take care yeah i'm sure I'll see you guys soon okay thanks